can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So what I thought I'd really do is, uh, is you see the title of the talk, because uh, pseudo-exfoliation syndrome is very common in my area, and it, and it helps uh, uh, understanding of uh, managing pseudo-exfoliation, I think, brings into the, uh, uh, all the aspects of really understanding um, how to manage difficult cases. Because if you look at uh, an average person with pseudo-exfoliation, you have to be aware of those, how to manage the pupil, how to manage the capsulorexis, the problems with rotation, uh, zonular issues, and, and what, when to use devices, uh, the camps or tension rings, and then late subluxation, which is, which is um, really a bugaboo that is uh, affecting all of us in, uh, in uh, regions where this is common. Uh, as you see, uh, uh, these are my potential conflicts. Just uh, an interesting thing that we're now beginning to look at. You know, we, as ophthalmologists, we've all we've always been sort of considered to be a um, a subspecialty, and uh, actually, I think we're more important than that. I think we're we're probably one of the only groups that really deals with patients from day one with congenital glaucomas to 106, and, and I don't think there's a human that can't doesn't need our care somewhere along the line. It could be just for glasses, it could be for contact lenses, it could be for glaucoma, and it certainly could be for cataract. So I, I think we are a primary care delivery per, uh, group. So, and that, as part of that, we're, we've started looking at the exfoliation syndrome in a more holistic uh, pattern. And what we're finding is very, it's very interesting. I think it goes back to some, uh, some of the difficult cases we deal with, such as the Marfan syndromes or wild Marchesani syndromes, these, uh, these uh, topics are, what we're finding is that the eye, as it does in everything, expresses the problems more openly than the others, but we're finding all sorts of interesting topics. There, it turns out that if you look at, at women uh, they have a higher rate of, with pseudoexfoliation, they have a higher rate of hernias, they have, uh, uh, there's also higher stroke rates in men, there's cardiac abnormalities and flow abnormalities, and these are all recently discussed uh, and learning about on huge databases that, uh, that we have access to in Utah because of the LDS Church has the lar world's largest data bank on, on, uh, on patients. And what we find is there's atrial fibrillation, pelvic organ prolapse, emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, hernias, and aneurysms. And these are not known in the ophthalmic community. So it's just a very interesting association that we're trying to become, again, more holistic in our understanding. So as everybody knows, it's a generalized disorder of the, of the matrix uh, and uh, really associated with LOXL1 allele. But it's very interesting, you know, in the, if you look at the original descriptions, which is almost 100 years ago, next year the 100th anniversary of the discovery of pseudoexfoliation would be, uh, and it was in, of course, Norway, and the, the classic distribution is totally wrong, and I would guess everybody in this room sees patients with pseudoexfoliation, maybe not as much as Norway or Sweden or parts of the United States, where I trained in Philadelphia, we had mostly an African-based population. We did not have very much pseudoexfoliation. I moved to Utah, which is very uh, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. We have tons of pseudoexfoliation. But as we make our trips, or doing a lot of international trips, we've now found it, big, big groups of it in Ethiopia, big groups of it in Tanzania, Guatemala has a huge population, Haiti, all of these populations that were not supposed to have pseudoexfoliation, we're now finding it. And as you can see, there's Mongolia. I don't know much about Indonesia uh, population, but it wouldn't surprise me if, because uh, one of the th new theories is, is about the association with uh, sunlight and latitude. So lots, lots to learn and makes it kind of fun. So. I like to think of this as, my, as a continually learning process. 
And I really have to, and I do have to say that one of the really nice things about a SECO, and they didn't ask me to say anything about it, but, but I think is the ability to, when we need something, they work with us and come, help us come up with the right instruments that we need to deal with many of these very complex problems. And so uh, I'm always happy to be a part of, the, of this group. And, and, and so we, we, again, when you think about what, what are the worries, and, and this is the same worry that you would have with any complex cataract. You know, how do you minimize your uh, problems? So we all know, we're all aware of the pupil abnormalities. A lot of times you can see these, this peripapillary atrophy. This is a case where, we, where I've done a Sioni ring modification. And even with that, you still have the potential for late subluxations. So when you think about these patients, again, I, I'm thinking of them as, a, as I would any complicated eye. And that is, you, you have to assess the capsule. Uh, look at the zonular issues. One of them, all our techniques, we want to minimize zonular stress, and that's why I love pre-chopping. And pre-chopping I like for another reason, is it allows you to, to divide a, a nucleus into quadrants before you have any flow in the eye. And I think that's critical for uh, I, IFIS cases, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, and, and also for other cases where you have loose zonules and that type of thing. So. It's a marriage of all technologies that, that, that's valuable. Uh, so when I look at the preoperatively, I, I want to know how well do they dilate, because that's going to be part of my game plan. Uh, check the depth. If you look for asymmetry, that'll give you a clue as to, to whether there's weakness or not weakness. And, and again, uh, look for other suggestions that might be uh, give, you, give us problems in cataract surgery. So here's, of course, a typical case of pseudoexfoliation. Uh, and, and when you look at the, at the slit lamp, you can see one side is slightly deeper than the other side. So that tells you if they're at all asymmetric, there's, a, there's zonular weakness there. So it, it helps you uh, clue into that uh, management. Uh, we used to do, we used to teach courses 20, 25 years ago on how to manage how to do cataract through a small pupil. And yes, you can do that. But I think the price is too high. I think when we do that, we don't, we don't get a good size rexus. We don't get good hydrodissection. Rotational issues become a problem. And we don't get as much cortex as we need. And I think this is part of the problem that lead to uh, late uh, subluxation. So, if you look, if you're doing the capsule rexus, if you start to notice that there is a wrinkling of the capsule when you start, that is suggestive of, of a potential zonular weakness. Uh, and when you're looking at these cases, you have to make the caps, the rexus 5.5 or a little larger, but not small because you, the rotation, I'll show you some slides, that uh, some Miyake views that we looked at in our laboratory to tell. And what I do is I, I've now become, I've standard for me now is not to have a, the old uh, style rexus where you lead it around. Essentially what I've tried to do is do a, a David Little maneuver all the way around, try to do an infinite number of those. So I, I keep it folded and tearing towards the center because it works, for me it works, it works beautifully. So we see here, uh, make a little bit of a, a tear, and then instead of leading that edge, I'm pulling in this direction here. And uh, the only, a couple times, obviously, uh, it's similar to our standard rexus, but you can hear this is like a little maneuver. So I, by tearing here, you can watch the edge as it goes around, and I also mark the cornea so I have the exact size of what I want to do preoperatively. And then, then you make your final tear, so you can actually control it very, very easily. You can see, instead of leading it here, I've got it folded over so it never goes out. It, 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 well, never, never say never, that's stupid, <laughs> but <laughs> I almost never go out. I, I have it, it so. so those are the, those are the kinds of things. So here's a, an example. Um, and this is interesting to me because it also goes to the point that we need to review our cases. So I did not see what I did wrong in this case, or missed, uh, as, and I'll show you here in a second. 
I'll try to make this. So this is a case, uh, pseudo exfoliation. He's had a, a, a LPI by a, another surgeon because he thought he had uh, narrow angles. He didn't. He had loose zonules. Now, so uh, we get going here, and you'll see here in just a second where, as I was reviewing, I missed the, uh, a very subtle but something I should have seen, and it is, you'll see it right. So as I'm starting to make my incision, get to it. And I usually do the, the, the I use uh, diamond knives from Masico and right there. So I didn't see that while I was doing it. That would have told me already that the zonules are weak. So look at right here. So I by I my I went in slightly more than I should have. But if you do that, you, you normally will just see an indent. You don't see that. So I, had I been smart enough to pick that up, other than in review, I would have known that it was going to be, it was uh, loose zonules. So let's just move ahead a little bit further. So again, review your cases. Look at them. Particularly, it was, it was surprising that I had completely missed that. And then here's my marker. Sorry about the video, it seems to be a little bit low. Now, as soon as you see here, see that's, look at the, the, the all the zonules. See, I, w I would have skipped that had I known that, because I, I still have to do it, so it's not, it's not a matter. So what I'm going to do is I use a sharp instrument to start it, a capsule rexus uh, uh, cystitome. And then once we do that, we'll go move ahead, you can get a little better. Now you can really see the pseudo exfoliation. And then make your neck. And then I use these, uh, this is a, uh, an Aseco capsule rexus forcep that I like, um, right angles. And you'll see that I'm, as I, you start it, and then you just tear centrally, and you get the, uh, uh, sort of the little maneuver without, without the rexus going out. So I think it gives, it, it takes a little bit of practice, but uh, it really makes the uh, capsule rexus, for me, a lot, a lot safer. So another thing that we've looked at in our laboratory is what's known as capsule phimosis or capsular contraction syndrome. And w what we're seeing is many of these late subluxation cases have capsule phimosis. And that's due to probably the zonules are partially weak, but the brexis is small and it starts to uh, become phimotic further tugs on the, on the zonules, and then eight, to, eight and a half to nine years later, uh, they, they, they drop. And this, this study that was done by Liliana Werner, but in a German population, not a U.S. population, what they were able to find is they, they looked at the, the cells in these lenses, and it didn't matter what style lenses, and what they found was pseudo-exfoliation in 70% of the cases that were not diagnosed as pseudo-X. They didn't have the classic pseudo-X material to it. So I think we've been missing these uh, a case, and, and you can see how phimotic that pupil, uh, that was pupil is, and you'll see other cases. So here's an example of why, uh, why we have to be aware of these. If you look at this, this is a Miyake view. I want you to look up here. So here, we, this is a case of, pseudo, we, we knew that this was a pseudo-exfoliation uh, patient. We were actually studying the ultra chopper, not, not this. And this changed my view of what I do. So we, we had a small rexus, pretty good hydrodissection, but if you, uh, so I want you to just look, look up here, and we'll, we'll do that again. And look at the, all the stress replaced on the zonules by rotating. The actual movement of rotation, we'll just do that again, is problematic. So what, what do we do differently? Well, we, we get a bigger rexus, better hydrodissection, and bimanual rotation rather than this kind of rotation. So we, the rotation is more elegant, less zonule. Or don't rotate at all. You know, in some of these cases, they're loose zonules. You're better off bringing them up, bring them out of the bag, Hemisect it and then bring it up is a, is a lot easier. Now, the other thing that we've been teaching, I've been teaching wrong for nearly 35 years, 
well, nearly more than that, sorry, but is how to do uh, INA. So if you look here, I want you to look, look up here. So this is, a, this is again, a posterior view. This is a Miyake view. We take, the, we take a cadaver eye, cut it this way, glue it to a, to a, um, to a slide, we have video up above and video down below. So that's, you're seeing the, the posterior view as if you're looking at it. This is, I'm sorry, this is the anterior view, but you'll see the posterior view in a minute. And so what we've done is we have, this is a standard INA, regular Alcon unit that we have in the lab, and we have only cortex. We don't have capsule. So if watch up here, the zonular stress, and then watch as, as, the, as it, we pull it, and you'll see that all the peripheral stuff is much, there's much less stress. So there's stress, there's stress up there, and we're only on cortex. Now watch as we pull centrally. If you look here, there's almost no stress on the peripheral zonules. So don't do, here, here's, the, here's what we should do. This is tangential uh, stretching or aspiration. And you see that there's no stress on the zonules. It turns out, not only is it better, safer on the zonules, it's faster. And you can use uh, any kind of INA material you want, but you see it's much, much safer on the, on the zonules. So if we just look at a few cases, you see here, so these are um, unedited views. And if you stay at the top of the caps, the caps are excess, not a deep, and just aim the, your tip as you go around, it's a very, very efficient way to do it. And you, it's very repeatable. It takes a little bit of trouble, time. So again, here's another, just a quick, you can see the mark on the cornea, and then we'll swing around. Once we, once we start swinging, then, then pull. Parts of it look similar, but you, again, the, the action is to pull this way, fold it back, and then you, then you can lead it all the way around. You can do it in one or two or three motions. The other one, the other expert at this is uh, uh, Akahoshi from Japan. He does it in one maneuver. I'm not that skilled, so I gotta use three. So, but, but if you think of the capsule, you're at the top of the capsule, and you stay, you point, instead of pointing the opening like this, point it towards the, the uh, cortex. And then you just move around until you pick it up. And you can just, you don't need to go to the center. You don't need to make any rota rotational motions. And it just disappears. High, good hydrodissection and a good understanding. So we don't, we don't need to see more than that. So what are the things that, that we're doing to make a, make a difference? Well, one is, and I often don't dilate my cataract patients. I do it intraoperatively. Uh, but I already know whether I'm going to do that. So one thing, even though that capsule looks big enough, I need to get, I want to be, uh, I want to get something that's six millimeters or more open so that I can do a five and a half millimeter rexus. Small rexus leads to rotational problems, leads to capsule phimosis and late subluxation. Right? And this is a bimanual rotation. So many beautiful videos. And then again, I pre-chop on every one of these when I can do this. And don't come out of the eye if it's, if it's, a, if it's a complicated eye, don't come out without putting viscoelastic back in, into the eye on each of the maneuvers so that the bag doesn't come forward, the zonules stay uh, closed, and you can rotate. Is the video okay? Uh, can you see? Uh, I, I can't tell from this angle, but... So, uh, and then the... Uh, so th those are the other types of maneuvers. Again, here's putting the viscoelastic in, and then, we, then we're going to do... Um, one of the things we've found since we've had the chance to look at all these uh, cases is they're much easier to reposition if you have a capsular tension ring in and you and you know you can put the ring in and then later eight years or nine years later it's very easy to, to pick it up and I'll show you a case of that a little bit later and then the other thing we want to be able to do is is to uh, remove anterior, anterior lens epithelial so I sweep 360 in 100% of the cases to decrease those capsule phimosis. If you're worried, you can always use visco dissection, uh, bimanual rotation, 
lens epithelial cell removal. So you're just sweeping back and forth. And that's, that can be done with um, devices. And I'm sure uh, when we're done, uh, Sagar can show you the numbers on, the, on these things. So here, it's, we'll just quickly move ahead in this case, no reason. There's the, there's the rexus. And at the end of the case, now that the, we didn't know that these were there, but now with the, with the beautiful uh, microscopes that we have, you can really see those cells. And, you, and all those are anterior lens epithelial cells. Those are what are going to cause capsule phimosis. Don't leave them in the eye, particularly in pseudoesfoliation cases. And um, some, some people, Dr. Sam Maska, for example, I, I bend mine so that they, I can go about 300, 360. He, he makes two extra stabs to completely remove as much as he possibly can. Uh, we'll see who's right in 10 years. <laughs> Hopefully we're all doing it well. The other thing, this is a late, one of my late cases, lens of, of subluxation. And, and if you look at, this is an incredible amount of Sommering's ring, and that is calcium. If it drops to the back, inflammation, and, and so when you're remove, when you're re doing uh, Iowa repositionings and stuff, that, but the trick is, don't let that happen. So make sure you get good uh, cortex removal as much as you can and get as many as lens epithelial cells. This is only eight years after the, after the surgery. And so a small rexus, not, not good on INA, left too much cortex. They sealed in there and becomes, it's, they're very, very hard to take away. So here's an, uh, I want to show a little, little example. This is a case where I'm going to do a, um, uh, obviously a toric. I knew preoperatively that the patient had pseudoexfoliation. I didn't see any difference in, in the eye, nothing going on. So I'm putting in a ring. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple things about a case like this. So put in the ring. There's no issues there. And I think everything's pretty normal. So I'm just go back. And I like to put the sub-incisional in. And then I usually do the other. So I go to the side. And no idea. Matter of fact, I didn't believe it. So I went back and looked. Nearly 180 degrees of zonia loss. Zonia gone. No movement, no anything. So when you're looking at a, so a case like this, what are you going to do now? And you think to yourself, you, you got to have a backup plan. Um, and so I was quite surprised. I kept looking at it. No, that's not true. Unfortunately, it was. So if you've got a room like this in, you can't bring, you can't put devices in. So you got to take it out, and then I switch to to uh, regular iris hooks because you've got to get that wide enough. And then you can use different kinds of uh, forceps or whatever to get the uh, rexus. You got again, you got to get a big enough rexus so you can do these kinds of cases. And also at the very end, you have different uh, capsule devices. McCool is is uh, one that we use, and uh, Asico has. Uh, slightly shorter ones that are nice. You've got to have these kind of devices when you have that much uh, de degree of, of zonulopathy. And then the other thing you do on a case like this is make sure that you lower your flow rate and you drop your, or you lower your bottle height or IOP if you have a centurion. And then uh, make sure your aspiration flow rate is 25 or less because that way you can tamponade the peripheral uh, uh, vitreous with a very dispersive viscoelastic, and if you keep the flow rate low, it'll stay there. So that way you can protect it. And again, come out, uh, only come out when you uh, do it. And I think bimanual is a very nice way to do this. Um, uh, you want to keep the flow, again, as low as you can, and it's much easier to, to switch back and forth and get all of the cortex out uh, very, very carefully. So, you know, and then I, I'm comfortable in these cases doing, this is two millimeters posterior to parse planted because I'm going to put in a, a Sioni variation uh, or an Ahmed segment, one of the two, plus a, uh, plus a CTR. And so I, I, what I do is I, these are two millimeters posterior to the limbus. Uh, they, these are MBR blades. And then this, in this case, we'll, we'll, we're going to use a grasper. Um, to bring the lens out, or to bring the, the Gore-Tex out. 
it's already inside the, the ring, and then, then you have a nice control at the end. And we, it was able, we did aura on the case, and I did use a, um, a CTR, because they're very, I mean, excuse me, I did use a toric lens in the pre-existing pre uh, toric prop, or pre-existing astigmatism. So if we look at the ways, the te ways we have of decrease of, of, of doing a cataract, if you will, and if you look, if you analyze them in terms of strain and zonular um, problems, the femto is probably the safest. It doesn't do anything, but it's very expensive. And often in these cases, it's hard because the cases aren't dilated. The ultra chopper, which is a, which is also a, a, a device used in South America, vertical chop, horizontal chop, and divide and conquer. Now, most most surgeons in the U.S. still do divide and conquer. But the trick when you're doing divide and conquer in a very complicated case is to use to to uh, use lots of energy, but very slow hands, and don't take a lot of material. So you just thin it out very slowly because if you go quick, you're gonna you're, you'll see quick actions, quick movements that cause problems with the uh, with the, the nuclear movement, and that that's, that can be a problem. The ultra chopper it used to be owned by. Alcon, but it's Luisa Scott from Colombia has bought it, rebought it, and it really now in in a month or two it's going to be available uh, in, on all uh, all devices. It vibrates at 46,000 cycles per second. It looks dangerous, but but it really isn't. And again, here's the rotation, and that's that's I so I do only by manual rotation because it really reduces. The, zon the zonular stress. So this is actually what it's doing. It's vibrating at 46,000 cycles per second, and it can be used in very, very tough cataracts. So here's a fairly dense cataract. Oh. Oh, stop. This is... I'm sorry, I'll go back to the... I didn't, uh, when did it go? Okay. Is that my fault? <laughs> okay. So let's go. Let's go back one. Sorry. So next slide. So in, in this case, it's a very dense. It's not. It's not uh, nigra, but it's it's fairly dense, and. Um, so I'm going to stain it. It's always nice to stain. That way you can put devices in if needed. And you can see that it's a little bit weak, but that's really not too bad. And then I can go ahead and do, I use the ultra chopper. And the, the problem, you saw right there, the little nuclear movement. I should, that means I have to slow down because you don't want the nucleus to move. And it looks dangerous, but it's the same size as a regular tip. So what Luisa Scoff did was he took he took a regular Kelman tip, put it in his vise, and switched it down to where it was this, and then and then now it's now it's made it looks more elegant. So but it's no bigger, so you, it's not very dangerous. It looks like it is, but you can see you can even on some of these tough cases you can really get nice I mean, and then this then my the, the thing that I think if you get, if you don't pre chop. I, I, I can only tell you that it is, it is such a great way to divide, put the nucleus into six, eight, nine, or ten pieces. And then once you get it into that, you, then, you, then you're more or less done. And I use it, and I'll show you in the next case. Um, we don't need to see the rest of that. It's just dividing procedures. So here's a femto. Uh, so this is all the technologies. Hi, Rick. Femto. Ultra chopper, pre chopper, and on all the devices. So, <laughs> so you can see that the, the pupil came down, which was interesting, and it, and the and the femtosecond caused it, uh, a little bit of bleeding there. So I had to use a ring. Now the the um, femto, you if if you have one, you'll you'll know this, but it often causes a little bit of phimosis. Usually you go back in; it's not a problem. But in in in, in pseudo exfoliation. It can be a problem. So again, very little, uh, 
the elegant type of, of um, uh, hydro dissection. Then I'll stain the capsule. Oops, let me get that down there. There we go. And why am I staining? I'm staining because if I have to put devices in, it is much easier to do this. So even though the even though the the, the femto has loosened and softened it up a little bit, it's still a very hard cataract. So what I'm going to do, oh, I didn't show that, but anyway, I used the, the ultra chopper, did not rotate, used the pre-chopper, cracked it, and then rotated, and the rest of it became more or less uh, routine. So again, use all the technologies that you have, and then again at the end, uh, of course, the CTR will go in and the lens epithelial removal. So. When we're looking at uh, d different devices, there's all sorts of uh, ways of doing this. Um, um, these devices can be used for uh, a number of cases. They really do help you intraoperatively. And uh, contraindications for CTRs would be a a certainly an anterior tear because they'll split out when you put the CTR in, and, or a posterior rent. Now, if you can convert the posterior rent to a, to a regular capsorexis, it, it, it's okay to put the, the uh, CTRs in. And everybody understands the mechanism of action. The timing is interesting. We like to do it as late as we can, but as early as we need to, and what, that sounds silly, but if you put it in right at the beginning, the nucleus is more stable, but it's very hard to rotate. And, it's, and particularly in hard nuclei, it's hard to get it in. and Cortical uh, uh, removal is challenging too. Even with the, even with the Henderson uh, uh, different kind of capsule that she devised, it still makes it very very difficult. And the other thing is is that we can then use temporary devices, and that's what they that's what they help to do it. And the CTR, it's nice to make sure that it goes around. One trick about this, if you if it doesn't seem to go, don't force it. Put a 10 nylon, non, regular 10 nylon suture through that, and then you can lead, the, lead it around and help it rotate much, much easier. So that's a nice little trick to, to do. Uh, when you, the Sioni modification is a nice one. MST and McCool make these capsule ones, and, and now I believe, and Asiko does as well now, so they're, they're really good to use. The sutures. We just got a new version from made from our lab, which which I've been we've been looking at in the lab. Very good suture material, and they're very. And I believe our lab is is producing a 10 -0 or a 8-0 uh, Gore-Tex type with a bit much better needle, and we're hoping to start using it in the United States. So, and we look about suture degradation. Why do we not use 10 proline on, on the sclera anymore? Is because of the, it usually it doesn't break here. It breaks where it's it's movement in the uh, uh, scleral tissue. So now 90 proline. If someone's 75 or older, I use 90 proline. Uh, we know it lasts 15 to 20 years at least. If they're younger than that, when I do pediatric cases, I use 80 Gore-Tex all the way up to when they're still very young. I, that The definition of young changes for me every year. We're now up to around 65. It's still considered pretty damn young. So next year, it'll go up again. So these, these, again, it's nice to be, have these devices available. You know, you can put them in um, very easily. Not easily, but you put them in, uh, and then you can... Uh, oh, let, me, let me bring that back. This This needle holder... So if you're going to do complicated cases, let me just suggest, there's a phenomenal surgeon in Singapore, and her name is, is uh, Pak, you know, Soon Pak, unbelievable. And she's designed a great uh, set of, of instruments that we buy, uh, and I, this, this is one I originally worked with, with Wasiko probably 15 years ago. These are intraocular needle holders. They allow you to manipulate and do things inside through a 23-gauge or small port, side port, and you can go across like that. I was able. Those needles are hard. Uh, if you go back, you can use that. I'll put it into the eye. Let me just go back there, and you can see right there. It just grabs the needle and puts it through. And they have uh, uh, that's wonderful. And the other thing is, if you're going to be bringing uh, intraocular lenses up and out. 
she de she designed a, gra a lens grasper that is uh, really elegant. And I think now, uh, I don't have a, a video of this yet because they, they won't release it, but there's the, um, uh, the new sutureless, bi uh, uh, glueless scale fixation from, from uh, Japan. Uh, I know that uh, Seiko is desi designing some instruments that will help you push it into the, the 30-gauge needle. And if you haven't seen that video, uh, I really suggest you do. I, it should be out soon. It's only still on the ASCRS website. But if you're a member, you, you can get access to it. It, it. it won the film festival this year, and a really elegant way of doing it. But again, you need to have this type of set. And, you know, most ho what we do in our hospital is we have three ASECO sets, because three or four of us are operating, and we need, often need them during the day. So, you, you know, if it's your own center, you might need just one or, or maybe two, depending on where you are. But there's getting these tough cases through, a lot of it is th the thinking process, but also a lot of it is facilitated by having the correct instru instruments as well. So if we go, we hit this. This is, these are Marfan's cases, and, and you, you have, uh, again, you have, uh, you can hold the bag, you can put these in and retrieve them with, the, with these uh, very nice instruments, again, that, um, that are in the set. Uh, and, and I, honestly, I get no, unfortunately, I get no financial reimbursement from that, but uh, no, it's, the, but these, they, when you're doing these tough cases, it's just so nice to have uh, the, the correct instrument. You can see here, stain that, there's a lot of, of torque. And, and when you're doing traumatic cases, Add two degrees to wherever you on both sides. Two clock hours on both sides. You think it's if you think it's 180, it's really 240. So and you can see here. And then again, uh, able to do uh, put the devices in to hold that while we're working. A uh, very simple device. The, this is um, the, uh, this is the early Seiko version of it. Uh, Sega. I, I haven't seen the most recent update, but this is one of the ones. But they allow you to do that, and again, there you go with the with the intraoperative intraocular micro needle holders and graspers. It makes it makes it so much easier, particularly with these lenses, and you can be very accurate in your placement. That's if you want to do, and you can do ab external, and you can be suture, but it's but it's so nice in many of these complicated eyes to have those kinds of devices. Another device that's nice is the Ahmed segment. And this was designed, he was a fellow of mine, but a brilliant fellow, obviously. And he, he figured out that you could just take the uh, regular CT, uh, Sioni version and, and make it much smaller. And they're nice to have because you can use them as a, as a hanger. So what you do is you put the device in here, and then you use a regular iris hook, put it through the eyelet, and you can hold it. Uh, here's an example. This is a pseudo exfoliation case of mine, and I knew that the zonules were weak because the chamber deepened, so I stayed it, even though I had a good view. And uh, the interest here is not the uh, rexus, but that, that was easier. So after doing hydro dissection, then I'm going to visco dissect, and to make this a very safe case, I'm going to put in one of these uh, Ahmed segments. These are mortar, and I believe. Uh, um, <laughs> Say you have to tell me somebody in in India makes it as well. Um, you, you, our lab does. Okay, so our lab in India makes a similar device. But see, you can just go in with this a regular iris hook, put it through the eyelet, and then you have 140 degrees of support. That allows you to do any kind of device. Again, you have to have a good rexus. And since I knew it was 360, I put one in on the other side. And that allows me to do any kind of maneuvers you want to do. And then at the end, it gives you the option. You can put a CTR in, or you can suture those, those to the, to the uh, sclera. Um, so it's very, very helpful uh, along in, that, in that kind of situation. There's also a new one. Uh, it's designed by uh, one of my partners, Bala Ambadi. He's a brilliant man. I'll just get to the end. So this is a Marfan syndrome. 
So when we're doing Marfan's cases, it, you got the capsule rexus is often the hardest part. So what we've done is we have these uh, capsule hooks that are pulling the, the nuclear, the, the whole bag away using a viscoelastic so I can complete the rexus. And then um, at the end, uh, th that allows me to, to just do like, more or less like a fairly regular type of case. And then at the very end, this device goes in like this. It's, so it's really PMMA all the way around, and it has two eyelets. And the advantage of this is that I can use it to uh, uh, separate. I separate the uh, stabs by four or five millimeters, and you can pull on one and pull on the other, and it just brings it up. This is going to be, this is, in, uh, Marcher makes this. I think there's uh, our labs looking at it as well. And, and it's a nice device for complicated eyes like this. I did put a CTR after I got it positioned where I wanted it, and that stabilizes it. That, these are Marfan's cases. Done a little over 100 of them right now, and they're um, we're looking at re reviewing the data. Uh, Dr. Vasavita's uh, twins were with me 10 years ago, hard to believe. And uh, they did our first uh, uh, paper on this, sort of 30 cases, and now we're up to, up to 100. Um, so the other thing that's nice, one of the questions we often get asked, are the, is the capsule rexus of a femto as good as a manual? And if you do strain gauge very, very good, very, very tight strain gauges, it is not quite as sharp. It, it gets better, the, they're very close to a manual, not, but the question is, how good is it? Well, in this case, this guy, this is the second eye of, of the guy who had, who was referred because a surgeon had started his first case and couldn't do the rexus because the lens was moving all over the place. So we did a, a, a femto on the first eye to get, to get around it. And this is the second eye. We already knew that the zonules were loose. So I was able to do the femto. I want you to see how loose these uh, zonules are. There we go. So watch as I, as I put in the viscoelastic, a little trouble, everything's shallowed at this point. Whoops, excuse me. <laughs> and you'll see here in just a second, the whole lens centers. So again, we're dealing with a very mobile bag. And so in this case, the Rexus was done beautifully and I was able to use devices to hold it to complete the case. And then at the end, uh, just make it more or less a routine case. So. So the, the point I'm trying to make of it, all this is, one, have a game plan and have lots of different game plans, backup plans. Uh, and I, I think get used to using these devices. Do them on, on, on routine eyes. Practice them on routine eyes. There's no downside to doing that. And, and then you're ready to, to, to use them when you, when you really need them. And so at the end of this, you'll see here there's... So the, the devices, even though this was a... It's, there was no support whatsoever. We were able to uh, put put the devices in and uh, suture the uh, to the wall. And those cases have fewer RDs and less secondary glaucomas than a vitrectomy lensectomy with a with a sutured IOL. So again, we're just trying to do that. So I have a few more cases, but I know I'm going over a lot over. Uh, and I think uh, Asiko is going to make this entire talk available to all of you. And um, I know that everybody's a little, a little bit late, so I apologize for running over, but I thank you for your attention, and it's really an honor to be asked to be here. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.